Hey, Sandy, what a pleasure to interview you for a number of different things, for work that we do here at IEEE, and just for the, I don't know, the seven people who don't know who you are. Can you provide a general introduction to who you are? Okay. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Um, so uh, my real name is Alex Pentland, but everybody calls me Sandy. Uh, I'm a professor at MIT, helped create the Media Lab back in the day, uh, and I've done a, a number of things in AI and data systems. I was uh, started the conversation that turned into GDPR. I uh, helped the UN put together the Sustainable Development Goal metrics, which is how do, can you actually tell what you're doing, right? Um, and I'm involved in a number of conversations to begin to put together sort of rules of the road for countries, companies, and citizens interacting. Well, Sandy, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, you are wildly humble, which I deeply appreciate. I mean, you are literally the top data scientist on the planet, <laughs> but whatever, we'll just move beyond that and say thank you so much for being, yeah. you know, for doing the interview. Um, so as I mentioned uh, in preparation for the interview, we're starting a new series, a webinar and podcast series and a, and a research line of research for the work uh, that I'm focused on uh, with regards to artificial intelligence systems and ethics for IEEE. And the title of the series is Measure Mentality. Um, <laughs> it's like seven syllables. But the yeah. point is, is we're focusing on measurement. Now, I know in a minute we're going to talk about your book, Social Physics, but you talk about a lot of these same terms. But just these general three questions. You're my first interview for the whole series. It's going to be about a year and a half of this, so I'm really honored that you're first. Um, but I want to make this very general, and, and here's the first question we're giving to everyone. How is success measured today in terms of artificial intelligence systems? So AI, how is success measured in AI? Well, mostly it's not. Um, or it's, it's uh, some sort of business KPI, like customer engagement or re extra revenue generated. And um, that's, of course, part of the problem is, is that, yeah, you can make more money, but if you uh, are discriminatory or have some other sort of thing, then, then you're not measuring that. Or if you have greater engagement but create echo chambers, uh, well, great, you got the, the added engagement, you can get more ad revenue, but you're just tearing society apart. So, so what needs to happen, of course, is that we need to have a more comprehensive way to measure what AI systems do. And I would say it's not just AI systems, it's all systems, companies, governments, civic actions. Um, currently, we have a sort of monomania around money and GDP. Uh, and historically, that's because we had this Great Depression Nobody knew if anything was working and what situation we were in, so they came up with this thing called gross domestic profit. Um, and, and that took off, and we started building things around that. And, and so we measure everything in terms of that and ignore things like, oh, but wait a second, does this leave some people behind? Is this good for kids? Does this lead to political insanity? Uh, and so we have to begin measuring those things. And forgive me for going on about it, but we're not the only ones that think this. So um, I'm on the board of directors for the UN Sustainable Development Goals data, and that's because we developed tools for actually measuring things like inequality and discrimination and environmental sustainability and so forth. And those are in the Sustainable Development Goals. The OECD, the, the sort of economic partnership among rich countries, has also just announced a very similar set of metrics to be able to measure what companies do. So people talk about holding companies uh, accountable for social effects, but the measurements that are out there now are all these sort of commercial things that don't work at all. They're embarrassment. And so they're trying to, to reform that so that we can actually say, well, does this company actually hurt the environment or not? Does this have a positive impact on society or not? 
Um, so, so they're involved in it. Uh, the World Economic Forum has a slightly different set of things. The most intriguing one is, is the big four accounting firms are, have announced a set of measurements that they want to use, and, and that matters because that means that every company is going to be measured in terms of standards like that. So the optimistic view is the world is converging to a way of measuring what the effect of an algorithm, a company, a new product is, and reflecting that, for instance, in tax policy, right? in regulation, which is, of course, where it needs to be. Well, that was wonderful. And, and that's really encouraging. I, I'll ask you more about the, the accounting firms, maybe offline. And uh, that's also really encouraging, because as you know, a lot of the work that we've done at IEEE is focused on, I'm using air quotes, well-being indicators which is really just what you've created. And thank you so much to the team that did the sustainable development goals, because it's a more holistic view of looking at things and literally taking a measure. So, okay. you know, thank you is the point. Well, it's not just me, it's a lot of people. <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, but you're the one I'm interviewing. But, but, um, but thank you, because that's a, that's a lot of the work we're doing in IEEE and we share that vision with you. So um, you, you kind of touched on my next question. Um, with regards to this measure mentality issue. And, and thank you, because you already answered a lot of this beautifully. But um, what's the positive future you're working to build with artificial intelligence systems? And maybe just to add to what you already said, because you've already been doing all this great stuff with the sustainable development goals, et cetera. You know, have fun with this answer. It's a year from now. It's two years from now. Um, 10 years, right? Uh, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. You know, because we, uh, I think what happens is we all work really hard sometimes to say, well, not you, but here's what we need to change that's quote wrong or bad or the status quo. But you're, you're a person who your whole career has been really seeing the future that so many people don't see and then working to build that. So you do what we're really trying to help people think about with this show. So like, what's your dream? Is there a utopia for Sandy Pentland? Well, um, a key thing and the reason that I'm involved with you and the IEEE is you, this idea of having autonomous AI is sort of crazy. Um, at MIT, I have an endowed chair. It was originally held by Marvin Minsky, who came up with the term AI. And he picked that term in no small part because it was provocative. The robot overlords are gonna take over, right? And, and so it could bring a lot of attention, but that's of course not what we want. We're not interested in that at all. What we're actually interested in is tools to make people smarter, tools to make communities smarter. And uh, so they're decision aids in some sense. That sounds very dry and businesslike. But, but you know, the, the most interesting example of AI that's out there today is uh, weather reports. So every night I see the weather report where they show this cone of where the storm's going to go and that's the probabilities. And that, that, cone of probability is the result of 10 worldwide models for atmospheric effects that they've put together and said, this is more likely than that. And, and you know what's really interesting? So that's one of the most sophisticated AIs in the world. It has more data, more sort of competition among models, etc., than almost anything out there. And yet average people understand it because it's displayed in a way that connects to people. And so they can say, okay, what's likely to happen? Should I take an umbrella? Should I walk? Whatever. So they, they are able to be smarter because of the advice given by these weather AIs. They don't tell you what to do. Sometimes they're wrong. This is a problem with all AIs, just like all human advisors. Take it with a grain of salt. But now you can imagine similar types of things. Uh, uh, you know, like for instance, with economics, can we actually predict financial crashes? Uh, I mean, you know, the famous <laughs> quote from the Queen of England who was confronting some economists in 2008 and said, why couldn't you predict this? And that's exactly right. Why couldn't they predict it? And it's because we don't have enough measurements, enough understanding of the system of science, but that turns into these sort of machine learning AI things that help us predict what's likely to happen. 
And we see some of that happening, but it's usually just for private companies to make money. What we need is we need to use that so that we don't get a 2008 again. Same thing with pandemics. We're all trapped now, half of us are out of uh, work, etc. cetera, uh, because we didn't see it coming. The data wasn't good enough, it wasn't prompt enough, the analytics associated with it weren't uh, accurate enough, and they continue to be pretty poor. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, people talk about listening to the science, but the science needs to come up about three notches. Uh, we do some of this, and uh, I'll tell you, to be like that weather report, it's got a long way to go. <laughs> So then I'm just, because I love that analogy that makes it so useful and helpful. It's like visually, and I, I hear a meteorologist, I know exactly what they're saying, take an umbrella, it's very pragmatic. So then just to build off what you said, do you feel like in five years, algorithmic, because uh, we haven't really touched on data privacy and data sovereignty yet, which you have so much experience and you're driving that so much, but like what, how would the, you know, five years from now, what's the, the weather version in five years that becomes a utopia, as it were? Well, so you're right that there are these questions around privacy and data ownership. Um, and I tend to be an optimist. I mean, you know, uh, when we started the discussion for GDPR, I was hopeful that that would happen quickly, but instead it took a decade. <laughs> it's just still rolling out. Um, but, you know, it is happening. You have GDPR, you have the California law, and around the world you see countries adopting privacy laws that are modeled on those two. So we're getting to a pretty good place. Uh, there needs to be a lot more. Having just those basic rights doesn't do it. You also have to be able to use those rights. And, and the discussion there I think is just uh, uh, in its sort of uh, baby clothes as it were. People talk about, why don't I get money from my data? And really the wrong way to think about it. Why don't I have a health care system that works? That's something to really think about, right? Or why doesn't the government work in this way or that way? Or why is there all this sort of inequality in, in the world? Well, that's because we maybe didn't know and we don't have good models of it. And people are not informed. The, the sort of key thing that technologists, the IEEE, tend to forget is that all of this is for people. It's tools for people. People have quirks, limited ability to understand. But if you do it right, they can understand very sophisticated things and act in concert, which is what you actually care about. A gun, go back to the weather. You know, everybody sort of understands it. They get their act together. They do the right sort of transportation, preparation. Um, you could imagine that sort of thing around pandemics or disease, right? And um, that's an optimistic view. I think that these things happen gradually. You'll see much better systems as a consequence of the current experience. Um, it's beginning to happen. You see it in certain areas like finance, like pandemics. Um, I'm trying to get a lot more sort of focused on inequality and and, and the sort of flourishing of, of neighborhoods. Uh, all of those things are beginning to happen. Uh, you see not just green shoots, but, but things actually getting better. They're not gonna be perfect. Even in five years, they're not gonna be perfect. But they could be a lot better than they are now. And uh, you know, if we sort of think about this, we could make these things be something that we're proud of. And keys to that are, of course, it's got to be for humans making better decisions. That's the key thing. That's why you're doing it. And it has to be broad, all the different aspects of life, not just money, not just infections or something like that. All of those are amazingly silly measurements because these things are multidimensional, right? Um, and they have to preserve this sort of agency. You can't have People talk about, oh, we have a big government agency to collect all this data. And I go, ah, <laughs> you know, I don't want the government to know who all my friends are, which is what you need to know to look at how infection spreads. Uh, I'm okay with my doctor knowing some things, maybe a couple local things, 
but I don't want that shared broadly. And fortunately, it's actually pretty easy to design systems that are intrinsically protective of uh, privacy and autonomy. Uh, they go under the name federated learning, where you don't move the data, you share insights between people, the way doctors are sharing insights about what treatment works, for instance, but they don't share the patient data. So, so if you think about it that way, what you're interested in is better policies, better insights, you're not interested in the data, so don't share the data. That's like the first thing. Those data lakes, the big government, you know, no, 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 no. You know, there are other ways to do it, and, and they actually are efficient and work, and, and that's one of the, uh, the campaigns that I'm on, is don't architect something that's a nightmare. Architect things that have, make it really hard to abuse. And it turns out it's not that hard to do, it's just a sort of different way of thinking about it. Oh, that's great. And you said so many great things I want to touch on. One is that, by the way, I, you know, again, just because of the IEEE thing, uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to work here was their tagline, which is advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. And to your point, I think um, uh, you just did so many things I want to touch on, so I'm trying to stay focused. Um, but I'll just go to my next question, which is, and you've already again touched on a lot of this, which uh, uh, in terms of measure mentality, what are the measures of success for the future you want to build? And now, sorry, I'm, I'm doing a bad interview thing, which is leading the interviewee, but you know, which is what I love that you've touched on though, are things like along with the technology is simplicity, communication, you know, clarity of communication, the value to people. Meaning I think I, I'm, one of the reasons I so appreciate your work so much is you deal with such complexity on so many levels at a systems level, but right now as you talk, it's very clear and simple. And and I'm even for people I think who are not technologists. So that said, what are what are your measures? And again, sorry, leading you a bit, but you already did it in your last question. What are your well, measures of success for that future? Yeah. So um, you mean of if we do things, what is the how are we going to know we did well? Right? Yeah, because like, you, you know, again, I say you invented, I know that it's you and Paul Nemitz and so many people have done the GDPR work and the SDGs, Jeffrey Sachs and what, you know, there's so many amazing people globally. Yeah, yeah. But you, you had a vision earlier of if these 17 things work in unison, and I'm again paraphrasing, but then that is literally metrics, meaning indicators of success, right? KPIs in the business parlance. Right. So, so, so yeah. the, the so the KPIs, in my view, are, um, does every neighborhood, every community, are they flourishing? Will their children do better than them? Are they uh, having opportunity? Because I think the thing to do is to focus on opportunity and autonomy uh, of individuals and of communities. I think pushing for uniformity, thinking, pushing for centrality is a fundamental uh, mistake in trying to do these things. It, first of all, poses a real threat to privacy, but also uh, fails to recognize that different cultures are different and different circumstances are different. Um, depending on, you know, your physical layout, on the, the types of people that you have in terms of age distribution and so forth, in terms of your history, you will want to do different things, and different things will lead to that sort of notion of uh, flourishing. The, the view I have is more of a, a, a learning network of communities, all of which are trying to invent their future, but sharing their insights and experiences with everybody else to help them do a better job of inventing their future. And it sounds very utopian, but we actually see this in, in many places. For instance, we see it in, you know, trying to create the, you know, treatments for the pandemic. We see it in uh, some of the medical things for infant mortality, for HIV. I mean, we've done these things in the past, uh, and we're doing them today. Uh, but we need to take those lessons for where they worked and spread them more broadly. And uh, just like that, you know, weather map, which is this incredibly complicated thing, 
phrased in ways that normal humans understand and can take action on so that you get coherence of action, which is what you need, um, uh, is, is, is the, a model for how to go forward. We also have these other models, which are the, you know, the sort of some of this sharing in science. It's not perfect. That's one of the things that people need to understand. And for instance, science goes off the rails all the time. But it does it in a way that over time gets better and better. And it's the coupling of the science with the engineering, with the real world. Uh, and if I had to say what is sort of the biggest mind change that we need to have, it's to move away from, you know, the God King tells us the right thing to do to the fact that we're all blind. We don't know the future. We don't know what will work. Uh, but if we cooperate, we can do better together. And we will make mistakes. Each of us will make mistakes. But by observing other people, by learning from that, by learning from our own things, we can move forward as a species, as a community. Um, but there's a certain humbleness about that, right? It's the admission that we don't know, that we aren't perfect, that we can learn from other people, even people that we don't understand at the moment. Um, and that, that that sort of thing needs to happen continuously. We never get to, you know, perfect. Well, that's beautiful. Seriously, thank you, Sandy. And um, uh, uh, what was it you said? Uh, sorry, I got lost in your answer there. Um, oh, oh, no, <laughs> oh, I did. That's really good. Say, no, that's good. Brain fog on you, right? No, I, yeah, well, it, I was moved. So thank you. Um, what I was going to say is, uh, since you're in the Boston area there with MIT, Somerville, Mass has actually done some of the leading work, uh, and I'm sure you're probably maybe part of it, of happiness and well-being and flourishing studies at the city level. Uh, years, this is 2013 maybe, mm -hmm. they actually did a survey of a happiness survey that got a lot of attention, but really what they did beautifully, because I knew some of the people doing that work, was they just had surveys and they walked around at a community level and said, how are we doing? You know, we just instituted, you know, whatever, a new set, series of traffic signs for safety. Yep. Are you aware? Right. And can you talk to that? Because I think this is where people think that the word flourishing sometimes can be sort of squishy, but you are foundational in creating or helping create being a part of, again, the sustainable development goals or, you know, these well, benchmarks. Yeah. Um, flourishing is a sort of a loaded ro uh, word. Various people take it to mean different things, which I think is fine. It means that you're um, focused on doing better in lots of ways, not just GDP, say, or, or you know, life expectancy. It's, it's this sense of, of, of living the way you want to live, okay? Um, it will mean different things to different people. It will not be the same around the world. Uh, and you can start in very simple ways, which is what you're talking about with Somerville. You could just go out and ask people questions. The, the, problem with that is the same thing as pro problem with the voting polling. People tend to tell you what they think you want to hear. They tell you what's on top of their mind. And often they don't know. I mean, just generally they don't know. Uh, and so they miss big things. Um, there's a sort of a, a blindness in various ways. It's, it's true of, of most of our life because we can only attend to so many things at a time, and it's a small number of things. So that's where data comes in, where, where uh, it's not just survey data, it's also, well, okay, uh, the example that is probably most accessible to people is the census. Uh, so how many people live in this neighborhood? How many houses are there? What's the average uh, uh, income of the family? That tells you a lot about the community right there. And you can argue about, is it exactly right? Or is it capturing the right thing? But it gives you this sort of sense of what's going on. Now we need to add a couple more things to it that have to do with opportunity. For instance, what other people, what other places do you uh, work? You know, where do the people in this neighborhood work? Where do they shop? How do the kids do? Right? Most people don't know how their kids are doing as a community. They may know their particular kid, 
But if you knew the statistics about how the kids in the community worked, you might have different opinions about it. And, and it ought to be that the schools um, engage in a continual discussion with the community about how they're doing. I'm not talking about teaching to the test. The schools are there for the community. If things are going wrong in the view of the community, then there needs to be a discussion. And the same is true of many topics. Policing is one that's a, a, a big topic right now. Some communities are happy with the policing. Others are very unhappy with it. Um, what's wrong? You need to have that sort of discussion. And it is much, much more uh, productive discussion if it's based on something that is that everybody will agree is a, an objective reality. Well, sometimes that's difficult to come to, that objective reality. We can do that with weather. Nobody argues too much about that. Um, but there are lots of things that, that are, are difficult uh, for different parties to agree. And, and what those discussions about those, those disagreements are, are really a, a discussion about the values of the parties involved. Right? What counts? And that's a discussion you need to have. Is that violent crime or is it not? Is it, you know, I mean, is this a successful childhood, you know, uh, measure or is it just some arbitrary bureaucratic thing? Those discussions about values and what matters are sort of the first thing that you have to do. And in fact, the IEEE has a standard for it. What is it? It's 1700 or 1703 or something like that? 7010-2020. Thank you there so much are. for that. Okay. I didn't even right, ask right, you for ethical that. Design. What is it you're trying to do in terms of the values? Uh, who are the stakeholders? How are you going to measure this? How are you going to then take an action to address things that are, are unhappy? And can you monitor it continually? And that's really the, the sort of... Uh, uh, mindset behind, for instance, the sustainable development goal data metrics is that for the, it, it finally occurred to these big organizations that if you don't measure it, it won't happen. And if you do measure it, um, even if the measurement's imperfect, you can at least have a discussion that has a chance of getting somewhere. And it's not easy. It doesn't happen instantly. But it gives you a basis for having a productive discussion. No, I love that. And, and um, it occurs to me, you know, how often, you know, because I've been a fan of your work for a while, how many different pieces that you're focused on that I care about so passionately as well. And from a systems mindset, well, it's true, as a systems mindset, um, do you feel like, if this is the right way to put it, you know, so often in artificial intelligence systems, policy and governance, it's, and, and I guess most technology, right? It's the don't overregulate you know, too, too fast. And maybe that sometimes businesses don't want to get regulated too fast. And then other people say self-regulation doesn't necessarily work. Then standards obviously uh, are great because they perform, you know, provide soft governance as a tool that can be used. However, that said, with the SDGs and with um, GDPR, am I right? Again, I'm leading you, um, but it feels like you sort of are working to give permission to businesses and governments alike, right? To say, are we valuing or counting all of the things that we should be counting that really are the most important? Educating our kids, taking care of the environment with the SDGs. Now I'm leading you, but is that true? Because it feels like there's a lot of pressure, especially in businesses. They want to quote, do the right thing, but they also have to adhere maybe to a status quo of certain things that are measured that they just can't get away from. And again, your thoughts. So, so the, um... The so sustainable development goals, right? The, if I had to say what was the most significant achievement of them, it is picking a handful, two handfuls of things that are agreed upon uh, measurements for a flourishing society, right? It says inequality matters, sustainability matters, blah, 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 matters, right? Um, and uh, that agreement allows you then to talk about, okay, well, if we agree on this, can we measure it? Well, if you 
tell me what it is you want to measure. We can figure out a good way to measure it. Might be a survey, might use other sorts of data. Um, and then we can have a discussion when we get some measurements about whether they're making progress or not. And that's just sort of, it's a very engineering way to, to think about things. And of course, it's a stretch to bring that to policy where people have all these philosophical sort of concerns and backgrounds. But that's really it. It's trying to make policy be also good engineering, right? Resulting good engineering, so that it's effective and that you know that it's effective and you know where it's not effective. Um, so that's that's the the sort of goal there. Um, Just going to build on that. You you were around so many amazing people in your work. I mean, I've seen you speak. You know, prime ministers and you, you know. Can you share a couple of or one story maybe that stands out where you knew that you were getting through to somebody, right? Uh, and and I mean, getting through to somebody like about helping them understand how to make something count, or maybe they were really focused on one area but you saw a breakthrough happen, or maybe where a breakthrough happened to you. Well, um, a lot of people comment on my approach to things, which is different than almost everybody else. Um, so for instance, in the discussions that led to GDPR, you know, what I was looking for was something that was a win for citizens, a win for government, and a win for companies. And trying to find that sort of thing that cut the Gordian knot um, was the goal. Not to be absolute this way or absolute that way, not to fight for rights or, you know, maximum, to be able to cut the, the, the Gordian knot. And one of the things about um, ESG measurements, you know, these are the, you know, environmental sustainability governance measurements, and I don't mean the ones that we have today. Those are just sort of, you know, an embarrassment. But um, they give you a way where you can begin saying, um, yeah, you're doing good on this, but what about this over here? Again, more of a fact-based discussion. And um, particularly with companies and governments and citizens, Imagine something where this was a standard sort of measurement that, you know, your auditor would produce every year, um, you know, what was your environmental impact, what was your impact on society, how much money did you make, all on equal footing. And let's imagine that your tax was based on that as a company, right? So maybe you made a lot of money, uh, or maybe you didn't make much money, but you did a lot of good things for the environment. Well, that ought to count, right? And, and, and the trade-off there is not, will vary, but it gives a way where people can get at the table and come to a win-win-win. That's actually the key thing. So like with the sustainable development goals, people say, well, but they don't have any teeth. Well, actually they do, and, but they're not in the document. What they are is you look over at the World Bank and you look at other things, and you find that uh, aid flows, loans, are conditioned on a country's performance on the sustainable development goals. So yeah, you can do that, but you're gonna pay more, right? Or you're just not gonna get the money. Uh, that's the sort of discussion that you now begin seeing. It's not an official enforcement mechanism. It's a way of saying, you know, we're gonna set up these penalties if you get off of the the helping everybody path. So a form of soft regulation in, the, in as much as it's kind of societal, not pressure, but kind of, right? Meaning it is a societal life. pressure. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's, it's a, you know, if, if you're, if you're going to pollute more, you're going to pay more because somebody's got to clean that up. It's going to be you. You made it. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I know we have a couple minutes. I definitely want to get to your book, but again, you, you, this is the heart of a lot of my passion is on measurement. Is there anything that I haven't touched on in terms of measurement or metrics or, or something that's resonated with you that you want to well, touch on? Well, the thing that, that I think people miss a lot, and, and I'm going to take a slightly extreme version of this, is, is that people talk about regulating AI. But AI is just patterns in data. That's really what it is. Um, 
And if you can control the data and also be able to see, oh, when this data went in, that decision went out, then that then you can take the normal things that we do with humans, with other institutions, and apply them to regulate AI. I think that once you have that accountability of the data, of the behavior, that you can then ask, in just the way we do with humans, just the way we do with institutions, is this what we want? And, and, and that's part of this measurability. You have to be able to measure the effects. Understanding the algorithm is sort of like an important, crazy thing we don't really, you know, I mean, it's, I don't think it's going to happen very easily at all. You can make models of algorithms that are more interpretable uh, to help people understand what's happening, but really what you want to be able to do is say, uh, did this help the children? Did this help the environment? Did this help whatever, right? Or did it hurt them? And so you have to look at the decisions and the impacts of those decisions, which means you have to have regular ways of measuring things that are visible to all of society, they're not secret things, uh, and are used uh, to hold people to, uh, to standards. Okay, so you couldn't have given me the more perfect soundbite for the show. So thank you, thank you for okay, that. Good. For, me for measure mentality, you just, I, I was like, Sometimes you do an interview and someone talks and you just see like the little sidebar quotes. Okay, well, good. I look forward to it. But seriously, thank you so much, Andy. What a gift this is for a first interview no, for no, the no. show. Well, I'm just saying, it's like, you know. All right, so, um, all right, Sandy, before we sign off, I have to talk about, and I have the weird screen thing happening here, so if people can't see it, social physics, how good ideas spread, the lessons from a new science. And yes, I'm gonna quote you to you, so lean back, enjoy your coffee. But um, at the beginning, in the preface here, you talk about most people think in relatively static terms, such as competition, rules, and sometimes complexity. I think in more dynamic evolutionary terms, paying attention to the flow of ideas within networks, the creation of social norms, and the processes that generate complexity. Most people think about using a framework centered on the individual and the eventual steady state outcome, whereas I think in terms of social physics growth processes within networks. So can you, I just wanted to quote that because I love it so much, but what was the inspiration for the book? And then how is it now evolved yeah. your work? So the inspiration for the book, I think you'll like. Um, I was at Davos for several years, the World Economic Forum, talking about data privacy, data ownership and, and other things. And I noticed that all of the discussions were based around this rational individual model that is you know, the heart of uh, economics. And also, if you know a little bit more about it, it's not a dynamic model. It's a, it's a what they call mean field or equilibrium model. Um, and that's just not the way humans or society is. Humans are affected by other humans and we're continually changing because the environment continually changes if nothing else. And in fact, if you look at uh, the invisible hand, which is often invoked, and what did Adam Smith say about it? He said it was the exchange of ideas and favors as well as money, right? Uh, and, and, but in that order that causes communities to establish norms of behavior. And he's dead right. What happened was is, you know, that wouldn't fit in the nice little mathematics of the, the early economists. Uh, we needed to know something about money during the Great Depression. And so it got cut down from the flow of ideas to how much money are you earning? Well, we need to open it up. I mean, it, it really is the flow of ideas, of opportunities, of favors, of, of trust that uh, dictates growth in, in, in wealth but also life expectancy, quality of life, intergenerational mobility, I mean, you name it. Those are the things that are the real clock springs. And they're not things that happen, you know, it's like it's not a static thing. It's a, it's a dynamic system, like weather, right, <laughs> that's happening. And, and you can look at inequality, you can look at all sorts of things in terms of this flow of ideas, and you find this is a much better explanation of what's happening than the sort of 
baseline economists, money, skills, you know, uh, static, you know, sort of uh, description that people use. So that's where I started it. And, and I must say, the nice thing is, is that uh, after a couple of years, I got um, a bunch of other people interested in it. David Lazar at Northeastern, who was at Harvard also, is a political scientist. And I put together a thing that was called Computational Social Science and got something published in, in the journal Science, which is very uh, uh, influential. And now there are literally hundreds of academic departments around the world um, thinking about the world this way. And we did a series of experiments looking at what can you measure using these types of, of dynamics. And that's the thing that's baked into the sustainable development goals. Um, and, and the more recent things that I've done uh, have also to do with that. How can communities know what they should do to improve their lot. That's sort of been the focus of, of what we're doing. And how can we build systems, this is a very IEEE thing, how can we build data, AI, and information systems that are secure, private, and measure the things uh, that we need to be able to measure uh, to build a flourishing society. Uh, and so that's, that's the focus of the the Building a New Economy book that we just uh, are putting out. Oh, congrats. All right, well, then I'll have to grill you about that new book right <laughs> after it comes out. And by okay. the way, social physics, it sounds like maybe there's a good standard in there. Yeah, huh? hopefully. The IEEE standard, huh? Subtle. Yeah, 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 subtle, yeah. subtle. subtle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very subtle. Good. All right, well, hey, Sandy, I, know, I thank you so much for your time. This is my so pleasure. My helpful pleasure. as always. My, really my, uh, my honor. Thank you very much. You take care. You too. Bye-bye.